Hello and welcome back to Zoology 141. Today's lecture is on bones and skeletal tissues. In today's lecture we're going to discuss the functions of bones. We're also going to examine the organic and inorganic components of bones and describe the anatomy of bones. We're going to learn about the processes that regulate both bone growth and also maintenance. And finally we're going to discuss the different types of fractures that bones can experience and talk a little bit about fracture repair. So up to this point we've talked about bone tissue, that is osseous tissue, as being a type of connective tissue. But today we're going to talk about bones as organs. And as you probably know there are some 206 bones in the human body and each is an organ and that's because each contains multiple types of tissue. So the types of tissues that we can find in bone of course include osseous tissue or bone tissue which is again a connective tissue. We can also find cartilage on bone and cartilage has a number of different functions in the skeletal system. We're also going to find dense fibrous connective tissue on the outside of bone, making up something called the periosteum. And also you should realize that bones are important places for the generation of blood cells, and so we're going to find a lot of hemopoietic tissue in there, as well as blood vessels. Remember that one big difference between cartilage and bone is that bone has a very good blood supply and can easily repair itself. Other types of tissues that we may find within bones include things like adipose tissue, that is fat, and of course nervous tissue. If you've ever broken a bone, you know that it hurts a whole lot, and that's because bones are very well innervated by neurons. Now as I said previously, it's important to realize that because each bone has a number of tissues in it, it is in fact an organ, and that these bones and the cartilages together make up the skeletal system. Okay, the skeletal system has a lot of different functions, some of which are obvious and you're probably familiar with, and some of which you probably aren't familiar with. One you are familiar with is support. The skeletal system is basically a scaffolding of hard parts that helps to hold our body erect. Another function you're probably familiar with is protection. The job of the skeletal system is to protect very delicate organs, like the brain, that is protected by the skull, and also the thoracic organs, the heart and the lungs, they're protected by the rib cage. Movement, of course, is also a very important function of the skeletal system, because the bones are basically levers to which our skeletal muscles are attached, allowing for movement and lifting and things like that. Another important function of bone is the storage of minerals. As you're probably aware, bone contains a lot of calcium, specifically calcium phosphate. And calcium is important for bones, of course, but it's also important for other processes in the body. For example, we need adequate amounts of calcium for muscle contraction. We also need adequate amounts of calcium for blood clotting. And so if we don't have enough calcium in the bloodstream, we tend to go to our bones and remove that calcium so that we'll have enough calcium for those functions. Another function of the skeletal system and bones in general is hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis, and this is the production of blood cells. As you're probably aware, there is bone marrow located in the ends of your long bones and also within the spongy bone within your pelvis. And this red bone marrow contains stem cells that produce red blood cells, white blood cells, and also platelets. And so this is another very important function of bone. And finally, bones are important for hormone production, and we'll talk a little bit about this towards the end of the lecture. Now we said before that the skeletal system contains some 206 bones, but we haven't talked yet about the cartilages. Cartilages are very important to the skeletal system because they help to reduce friction in joints, they also help to serve as shock absorbers. And so there's three different types of cartilage that we're going to find associated with the skeletal system. And these include hyaline cartilages, Remember, hyaline cartilage is a cartilage that has a very thick extracellular matrix. We have those little cells that live down in the lacunae, and we tend to find hyaline cartilages located on joints, and a joint is basically where two bones uh, meet or rub together. And this hyaline cartilage is very smooth, and it also has some fluid on it that helps to reduce friction in joints. Another type of cartilage that we find associated with the skeletal system is elastic cartilage. Now elastic cartilage has a lot more fibers than hyaline cartilage, and we said one place we can find elastic cartilage is in the ears, but we can also find it in the epiglottis. The epiglottis is basically a valve that helps to cover up the opening to our trachea when we're swallowing food, and in this way it helps to prevent food from going down the wrong tube. Finally, the third type of cartilage that is really important to the skeletal system is fibrocartilage.
fiber cartilage is probably the toughest, most fibrous of the three cartilage types, and it's found principally uh, in between vertebra. That is, it makes up a cushiony joint in between each of the vertebrae in a vertebral column, and it helps to reduce stress and also compression. We'll talk more about cartilages when we talk about joints and joint movements. For now, let's go talk about the five different types of bones. So one way we can classify bones is based on their shape. And so we have long bones, short bones, flat bones, irregular bones, and also something called a sesamoid bone. So let's take a look first at the long bones. Long bones are bones that are longer than they are wide. So examples of this would be the humerus from the upper arm, and also the femur from the upper leg, and the tibia and fibula. These tend to have a shaft composed of compact bone, and the spongy bone tends to be located towards the ends. On the other hand, short bones are things that we find, let's say, in the wrist and also in the ankle, that is the carpus and the tarsus, and these are short, square-like bones that are composed mostly of spongy bone surrounded by an outside finish of compact bone. And then, of course, we find flat bones. Uh, one very good example of a flat bone would be something like the scapula or the shoulder blade. It's a very flat, narrow bone composed mostly of compact bone with a very narrow sandwich of spongy bone on the inside. And then we have a catch-all category called irregular bones. Irregular bones are bones that are irregularly shaped, things like a vertebra. So a vertebra has some spongy bone on the inside and then compact bone on the outside, but it also has a very irregular shape, so we call it an irregular bone. And finally, some textbooks will have a fifth classification called a sesamoid bone. What does this word sound like? Well, it sounds like sesame seed. And so sesamoid bones are sesame seed shaped bones that are usually found within tendons and they help to reduce friction and also help to optimize the angle of muscle pull to make our joints more efficient. We'll talk more about sesamoid bones when we talk about joints. So all of the 206 bones in the body should fall into one of these five categories. There is maybe a sixth category called sutural bones, and sutural bones are not included in that count of 206 bones. These are bones that are inadvertently formed uh, when a suture forms in between two bones and isolates a third bone. So we'll talk about sutural bones when we look at the skeletal system, specifically looking at the axial skeleton and the skull. Another way that we classify bones in the skeletal system is by calling them axial bones or appendicular bones. So bones of the axial skeleton include the skull, the vertebrae, the ribs, and the sternum. And these are basically all the bones that are in a straight line. And that's what the word axis means. It means line. So extending from the top of the skull down to the sacrum, all of these bones are part of the axial skeleton. On the other hand, the appendicular skeleton is everything else. That is, everything that's appended to the axial skeleton. This includes things like the pelvis or hips, uh, the scapulae or shoulders, as well as the arms and legs and the bones that make those up. So if you look at the picture at right, everything that is in blue is part of the axial skeleton and everything that is in orange is part of the appendicular skeleton. And we'll talk more about these two divisions in the next lecture. So as I said a couple slides back, there are several different types of bones based on their shape. So today we're going to describe the anatomy of just one single type of bone, that is a long bone. A long bone would be a bone that we find, for example, in the arm or the leg that's longer than it is wide. And so here are some terms that you need to be familiar with when classifying long bones. So our example for a long bone today will be the humerus. The humerus is the bone that makes up the upper part of the arm or the brachium. So the first part of a long bone that you need to be familiar with is something called the epiphysis, or sometimes pronounced epiphysis. The epiphyses are basically the rounded distal ends of the bone. Here you can see we have one that's more superior and another one that's more inferior. So the epiphyses are rounded areas of the bone that tend to articulate with other bones. And the epiphyses of most long bones contain a lot of spongy bone. In addition, most epiphyses are covered with hyaline cartilage because they rub against other bones. Remember, the purpose of hyaline cartilage in a joint or arthrosis is to reduce the friction between two bones. And so most epiphyses will be covered with a nice smooth layer of hyaline cartilage. So whereas the epiphysis was the end of the bone, the diaphysis is the middle or shaft of the bone. The diaphysis of most long bones is composed exclusively of compact bone. And remember, compact bone had the functional unit of the osteon, and we'll review that in just a minute. 
The other thing you should know about the diaphysis is that it's often hollow. That is, it has a marrow cavity in there in which we can find yellow bone marrow. Oh, and there it is. Our marrow cavity usually houses yellow bone marrow, which is actually fat. Now, unlike red bone marrow, which generates blood cells, the yellow bone marrow really doesn't do anything. We can call upon it on times of nutritional need and metabolize that fat, or sometimes in times of need for more red blood cells, some of this yellow bone marrow can actually transition back to red bone marrow and help with blood cell production. The other thing that we find associated with the diaphysis is a covering called the periosteum. Remember that peri means outside or around, and so periosteum is a type of connective tissue membrane surrounding the outside of the bone, and it's important because it contains lots of blood vessels and nerves, and it also is the source for osteoblasts, which are cells that are going to help us to rebuild and repair bone. So midway between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, we find something called the metaphysis, or metaphysis. And as the word implies, this is just in the middle. And one important thing about the metaphysis is that the area where our growth plate is located. The growth plate is an area of actively dividing cells that contains both cartilage and osseous tissue. And the growth plate helps the bones to elongate or grow in length. And we'll talk more about growth plates a little later on in the lecture. In addition to the general anatomy of bones that we've just talked about, you're also going to need to be able to recognize and identify specific markings and holes that we find on individual bones. And so these include things like depressions and openings, projections that aid in muscle attachment, and also projections that help to form a joint. And a list of these projections and openings can be found on page 180, table 6.1 in your textbook. We're not going to go through all of these today because they are more important for lab rather than lecture, but we are going to go through a few of the major markings, depressions, and openings in the next few slides. So the first depression or opening that you need to be familiar with is something called a foramen. A foramen is basically a hole in a bone. And at the top left-hand side of the screen, you can see the vertebral foramen. This is a foramen that allows the passage of the spinal cord through the vertebral column. And so foramen are usually passageways for either nervous tissue, for blood vessels, or for other organs. Another type of foramen you see at the bottom left is something called the obturator foramen. The obturator foramen is a type of hole that we find in the pelvis. And finally, the largest foramen, the one that you probably need to be most familiar with, is called the foramen magnum. And the foramen magnum is basically the hole in the bottom or inferior part of the skull that allows the passageway of the spinal cord uh, into the skull where it eventually becomes the brain. And so the way that I remember foramen magnum is just think about what would happen if Dirty Harry shot somebody in the base of the skull with his magnum. It would make a really big hole, and we would call that the foramen magnum. Now let's take a look at processes. Processes are projections or bumps and specifically a spine is a very sharp slender projection and we have two different examples of spines or spinous processes here. At the left hand side of the screen you can see a vertebra and pointing with a red arrow we have the spinous process of that vertebra. Now spinous processes are basically attachment sites for muscles and so they have a wide narrow uh, surface area through which the muscles of the back can attach. And you've probably seen these spinous processes if you ever go to the swimming pool and you see a really skinny kid is bent over and it looks like he's a stegosaurus. Well that's because the spinous processes are projecting somewhat through his skin. On the right hand side of the screen we have another example of a spine and this is on the scapula or shoulder blade. So the spine divides the scapula into an inferior and superior part and again the spine is an attachment area for muscles. So while we've got the scapula up here I should talk about the next term and the next term is something called a fossa which is singular or fossae which are plural. A fossa is a depression. It's not a hole, but it's a ditch that we find in a bone, and usually it's an area where a muscle resides. For example, at the top of the screen, we see something called the supraspinous fossa, and this is a fossa that is above the spinous process of the scapula. And here's where we find a muscle, and that muscle is called, get this, the supraspinatus. Now let's take a look at the inferior part of the scapula. You can see another depression or hollow place and that's called the infraspinous fossa. And this is where we have another muscle that's called the infraspinatus. So here's something that's really important. 
if you know your bones really well and you know the markings that are on that bone you're going to have an easier time when it comes to the muscular system when we learn all of the different muscles because a lot of the muscles are named for their locations or attachment sites along the skeletal system okay another part of anatomy of a bone that we need to know is something called the head the head tends to be the superior most part of the bone. If we're talking about a long bone, we can also say that it's the most proximal part. That is, it's closest to the attachment site on the body. And so here we can see the head of the femur. Now here the head of the femur is nice and round, and that's because the socket it's going into is going to be a concavity that has a complementary shape. So the head is the superior most part of the bone, and just like you, below the head we find something called the neck. The neck tends to be a narrow part of the bone where there's a lot of stress. Another term you need to be familiar with, at least in terms of the femur, is something called a trochanter. A trochanter is a big, rounded, blunt bump on either side of the femur, and the trochanters are basically attachment sites for very large muscles. And so we have the greater trochanter and also the lesser trochanter. And of course the greater trochanter is much larger than the lesser trochanter. And just remember that these are attachment sites for very big, powerful muscles. Another type of muscle attachment is called a tuberosity. A tuberosity is basically a rough area, usually located midway down a long bone. And so the example here that we're pointing to is on the humerus. Remember, the humerus is in the upper arm, and this specific tuberosity is called the deltoid tuberosity. Now the deltoid muscle is a muscle on the side of your arm that helps you to abduct your arms or hold them out and so they attach midway down the humerus on something called the deltoid tuberosity. And this is a case where it's going to be much easier to learn this type of marking once you have access to the bones in the lab and you can actually feel them. There's a very rough part where the tendon of the deltoid muscle attaches about one third the way down the length of the humerus and we call this the deltoid tuberosity. So trochanters and tuberosities are sites of muscle attachment. On the other hand, condyles are actually areas where one bone articulates with another bone. So here let's take a look at the distal epiphysis of both the humerus on the left hand side and the femur on the right hand side. And remember that the epiphyses are usually areas that are going to articulate or rub against other bones. And so the areas that rub against those other bones tend to have this very rounded architecture, and we call this rounded architecture a condyle. And so on the left-hand side, you can see the condyles of the humerus, and they have specific names that we'll learn about in the next chapter. And we can also see the femoral condyles, and these are condyles that rub against the proximal part of the tibia. And so, again, the condyles tend to be nice and round and allow a very nice range of motion. And again, they're covered with hyaline cartilage. Now, the second term you need to be familiar with is something called an epicondyle. Think about what the word epi meant. It usually meant on top, but here it means sort of to the side. So an epicondyle is really not part of a joint per se, but it is a bump that's just above a condyle. And so the epicondyle that we can see here is the median epicondyle of the humerus. And unlike condyles, which articulate to form joints, the epicondyles are usually sites of muscle attachment. So one last thing we need to talk about as far as bone anatomy is that there are in fact something called nutrient foramina or nutrient foramens located in the bones. And these are basically holes that are located within the shaft of the long bones that allow passageway of both blood vessels and also nerves. Because remember, bones are very vascular organs and they are also well innervated by nervous tissue.
Okay, so here you can see a closer view of an osteon. Remember an osteon is the functional unit of compact bone, and osteons are basically circular arrangements of lamellae, which are walls of bone, that surround something called a haversian canal. Now the haversian canal is basically a central hole through which blood vessels and nerves run through the bone, and eventually these are going to merge with the blood vessels that were entering the bone from the nutrient foramina on the outside. And so the center of the osteon contains the herversion canal, which is basically the source of nutrients and oxygen for all the cells that are surrounding it. So the concentric lamellae are walls of bone that surround that herversion canal. And the bone's made up of collagen and also made up of hydroxyapatite, which is calcium phosphate. But if you take a look very closely at the osteon, you can see little bitty holes or pukas in there, which are called lacunae. And so a lacuna is basically a lake or hole, just like what we found in cartilage, where a cell lives. And the cell that lives in the lacuna here is something called an osteocyte, or bone cell. An osteocyte's job is to maintain the surrounding matrix. And so if you look at the top right-hand side of the screen, you can see one of these osteocytes. You can see also that there's some small canals that lead away from the osteocyte, towards the Haversian Canal, and these are called canaliculi. Canaliculi are basically little bitty canals that link the osteocyte to the Haversian Canal. And it's important because unlike cartilage where the chondrocytes were isolated from any nutrient supply, the osteocytes have a very good connection to the nutrient supply through these canaliculi. And as a result, bone can grow very fast, and it can also repair itself very quickly as well. Now the other type of bone that we've already talked about is something called spongy bone. Now spongy bone is a sponge-like bone that tends to be found in the epiphyses of long bones. And it's composed of something called trabeculae. Trabeculae is just a fancy word, basically meaning little beams. And so at the bottom right you can see a microscopic view of spongy bone and take a look at the trabeculae. So the trabeculae are composed of collagen and also calcium phosphate, but they tend to be organized in a way to make sure that they support the stress of the bone. And depending on what type of long bone we're going to talk about, the stress can be primarily vertical or a little bit more oblique. Now the other thing you should know about the spongy bone is that it contains the red bone marrow. Remember that red bone marrow was a hemopoietic tissue that helped us to generate new blood cells. That is red blood cells, white blood cells, and also platelets. And so one very important function of the spongy bone is hematopoiesis. Now remember that osseous tissue or bone tissue was a connective tissue. And remember that connective tissues are composed primarily of non-cellular material. So let's talk a little bit about the material that makes up bone. So bone has two different types of material that make up the matrix. The first is something called the organic component. And basically by organic we mean carbon containing. And so the organic component is composed of something called osteoid. And osteoid makes up about 33% of the matrix of bone. And the osteoid here includes a ground substance of polyglycans and glycoproteins, as well as lots and lots and lots of very tough collagen fibers. So if you take a look at the picture of right, you can see some examples of the collagen fibers that make up the matrix of bone. And you see that they tend to be oriented in all different directions, but primarily oriented in an up-to-down direction. And the collagen is very important because it gives bone a tensile strength rivaling that of steel. And the collagen here is very tough, but it's also designed to break in times of stress. For example, if you jump down from a wall and land very hard on your feet, chances are you're going to sever some of these microscopic collagen connections within the bone. But they are designed to sever in order to take some of the stress off the bone and prevent it from fracturing. This is sort of the same way that uh, cars have a crumple zone that is designed to crumple but protect the internal passengers. And so these severed collagen connections can eventually be repaired without any obvious harm to the bones. So the second part of the bone matrix is made up of inorganic components. That is, about 65% of bone is made up of things that are not organic or do not contain carbon. And the main inorganic component here is something called hydroxyapatite, which is the mineral name here for calcium phosphate. And calcium phosphate gives bones their rigidity, their hardness, and so it of course needs a lot of calcium for it and also a lot of phosphorus. And at the right hand side you can see a picture of hydroxyapatite crystals.
So in a few slides we'll talk about how the body maintains the levels of hydroxyapatite in the bones. So in the last slide we talked about the components of the matrix, that is the non-cellular part of bone, and now we're going to talk about the cellular part of bone. So bones have five cells that are important in bone growth and remodeling. We're only going to talk about the top three of these cells, that is the most important three cells. And these include the osteoblasts, the osteocytes, and the osteoclasts. So the first of these cells is something called an osteoblast. Remember the word osteo means bone, and a blast is an immature cell that's usually secreting something. And so the job of the osteoblast is to build bone. That is, it takes any excess calcium that we have in our bloodstream and it deposits that into the bone in order to make them stronger. The second type of cell we see is an osteocyte, or bone cell. And this is a mature bone cell that lives within those lacunae in the compact bone or between the trabeculae of spongy bone. And all the osteocyte does is maintain the existing matrix of bone. It really doesn't build new bone. And finally, the third cell is something called an osteoclast. And the word clast means to break down or break away. And so an osteoclast is a cell that actually breaks down bone and frees up calcium for the bloodstream. And osteoclasts are actually derived from a white blood cell, and their job, again, is to break down bone in order to remove calcium from that bone and put it in the bloodstream. And osteoclasts are very important because they help us draw upon the calcium stored in the bones so that we can have adequate amounts of calcium for things that are really important like muscle contraction, nerve impulses, and also blood clotting. And so if you're not getting enough calcium in your diet, chances are your osteoclasts are eating away at your bones and liberating calcium from the bones and putting it back into the bloodstream. Okay, this slide is just here to remind me, to remind you, that calcium is important for other things besides bones. I know I've already said this twice, but I'm going to say it a third time just to drive home the point. So in addition to needing calcium for the bones, we also need it for nerve impulses, for muscle contraction, for blood clotting, and also for enzyme function. And so calcium is a very, very necessary nutrient for all areas of the body. If we don't have enough calcium in the bloodstream, that can lead to respiratory arrest, whereas if we have too much calcium in the bloodstream, that can basically stop the heart from contracting and put us in cardiac arrest. So calcium has to be maintained within normal levels of around 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. So the take-home point here is that there's many important functions for calcium in the body and probably serving as the skeletal system is probably the least important. Because bones, yeah, they're important for holding us upright, but they contain a lot of calcium. So if we don't have a lot of calcium for our bloodstream, we're always going to go to the bone and take that calcium out so that we can maintain our heart beating, our lungs breathing, and also our blood clotting. So the bones are always going to have their calcium taken away if we don't have enough calcium coming in through the diet. So we already said that there's a very narrow set point for blood levels of calcium, and that's between 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. Now you don't need to memorize that number, you just need to appreciate the fact that it's a very narrow range. And so we have a very finely tuned negative feedback loop that governs blood calcium homeostasis. And remember that blood calcium can be coming from the diet, that is through calcium-rich foods, or if we're not getting enough from our diet, it's going to come from our bones our bones are a very good reservoir for calcium. And so what happens if our blood calcium levels start to drop, we're going to increase our secretion of something called parathyroid hormone. Now, as the name implies, parathyroid hormone comes from very small glands called parathyroid glands. And parathyroid glands are located attached to the backside of the thyroid, or Adam's apple. So here you can see the thyroid gland. Well, that's not the parathyroid. The parathyroid are the little dots at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So they're very minuscule glands, but also very, very important because they secrete PTH, or parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone is secreted in times when blood calcium is lower than normal. And what parathyroid hormone does is it signals our osteoclasts to become more aggressive. It basically tells them to increase in number and also increase their rate of bone destruction. And as they destroy more bone, that excess calcium is going to be taken from the bone and put in the bloodstream. And that should bring us back into homeostasis. That is, the increased activity of the osteoclasts under the direction of PTH should raise our blood calcium levels back into the optimal range of 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. And once that happens, our production of PTH will level off or turn off so that we don't get too much blood calcium.
Now your textbook also talks about some other hormones such as calcitonin. Now calcitonin is a little bit important in calcium homeostasis and what it does is help to increase the rate of bone deposition when we have an excess of calcium in the bloodstream. Let's say you've sat down for a calcium rich meal of dairy and a little bit of kale and some other green leafy vegetables. If you get excess calcium in the bloodstream, your levels of calcitonin will increase slightly and this will lead to a slight increase in bone deposition. Now I say slight because as it turns out, we now know that PTH is much more important in regulating blood calcium homeostasis than calcitonin is. So know that calcitonin has a minor function, but that PTH is the one that really regulates blood calcium homeostasis. So now we're going to take a closer look at endochondrial bone formation. And remember, endochondrial bone formation was very important for the long bones of the body, such as the femur, the humerus, the tibia, fibula, radius, and ulna, and others as well. And so as the name implies, endochondral ossification starts with a cartilage model. And it's important to realize that all the bones in the fetus before week eight are actually entirely made of cartilage. And so these cartilages are formed by fibroblasts and chondroblasts, and they help to build this cartilage model. Now once that cartilage model is laid down, it will begin to grow under the direction of our fibroblasts and also our chondrocytes. But the other thing that will happen is we'll form a bony collar around the diaphysis of that cartilage model. And the bony collar is important because it limits the diffusion of nutrients into the inside of the cartilage model. As a result, the cartilage cells that are in there start to die off because they don't have any nutrients. And so that dark area you can see within the diaphysis or shaft of this cartilage model is actually dying cartilage cells. Now around month three of development, we form something called the primary ossification center. And as the name implies, the primary ossification center is the initial site of ossification within this newly forming bone. And the way in which this happens is basically a periosteal bud comes in from the outside and bores its way into the inside of this marrow cavity. And the periosteal bud contains lots of stem cells. Some of these cells will become osteoblasts, that is the cells that build bone. Some of them will become nervous tissue and some of them will become vascular tissue. And so the first cells that actually ossify this are going to be our osteoblasts that build spongy bone. So the first bone that's actually laid down is spongy bone, and it's laid down initially within the diaphysis. Now once that primary ossification center forms and extends out towards the ends, we then have invasion of our osteoclasts. And the osteoclasts will basically eat away the internal part of the spongy bone that made up the diaphysis. They will leave the bone on the outside, which is compact bone, but eat away that spongy bone. And this is important because these osteoclasts are basically helping us to clear up a medullary cavity. And the medullary cavity was just the hollow part of the shaft of the long bone. And so the last part of endochondrial bone formation is the formation of a secondary ossification center. And the secondary ossification center forms within the epiphysis or epiphyses of the long bones. And just like we had with the primary ossification center, we have basically the invasion of a periosteal bud from the outside, which bores its way uh, into that cartilage and then releases osteoblasts, which begin to convert that cartilage into spongy bone. Now the big difference that happens here is that within the secondary ossification centers, we don't see any movement of osteoclasts into that area. That is, they don't eventually eat that bone away and form a cavity. And so what remains in the tips of the long bones is a nice core of spongy bone, but it's surrounded on the outside by the remnants of that cartilage that'll form the articular cartilages and also cartilage inferior to that, which will be called the growth plate. 
and we'll talk more about the growth plate in just a minute. Now remembering back from the last slide, we said the secondary ossification center we ossified the epiphyses or distal ends of the bones. And it's important to realize that this ossification is incomplete. It leaves a nice thick coating of cartilage on the outside of the bone, which will be called the articular cartilage or joint cartilage. And initially it also leaves a piece of cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And this piece of cartilage is called the growth plate or epiphyseal line. And the epiphyseal line is very important because it contains lots of actively dividing cartilage cells. And these cartilage cells will lay down new cartilage uh, adjacent to the epiphysis. And basically that new cartilage will cause elongation of the bone, forcing the epiphysis away from the diaphysis. Now as this bone elongates with cartilage, the cells on the back side, the diaphysis side of this growth plate will begin to break down and this tissue will become ossified with calcium phosphate. So it once was cartilage, now it becomes bone and it will also be hollowed out by our continuous action of our osteoclasts. So the result of this growth plate is that bones are elongating and growing in length and at the same time they're hollowing out due to the activity of our osteoclasts. Now what's interesting is you can actually see these epiphyseal lines on an x-ray. If you take a look at the top hand right side of the screen, you can see the epiphyseal line that we see within the tibia. The tibia is a large bone that makes up the shin of the leg. And so this is the proximal part of the tibia. You can see a thin black line that indicates we have an area where there's not a lot of bone, but it is a lot of cartilage. And so the presence of this epiphyseal line on an x-ray tells us that this person is probably a juvenile and probably still growing. Because what happens between the ages of 18 to 21, maybe even 25, is these growth plates will eventually ossify and become bone. And once that happens, growth and length of these long bones is no longer going to be possible. So as a result, you can't grow any taller after you're, say, 21, 25, because your growth plates have fused. Now up to this point, if you know that somebody is not growing up to their potential, we can talk about supplementing with hormones such as human growth hormone and so forth, but once these growth plates are fused, there's very little likelihood that you're ever going to grow any taller, and that's because your growth plates are fused. Now the second type of bone growth we have is something called appositional growth. And appositional growth is the growth in the width or girth of a bone. And unlike growth in length, appositional growth can go on throughout life. And so appositional growth involves stressors on the bone which initiate the activity of osteoblasts. Remember, osteoblasts are the cells that build bone, but here they're originating from the periosteum. So if you take a look at the picture at the top left hand side of the screen, you can see the periosteum and has blood vessels going through it, and there's a depression where one of those blood vessels is running. Now what happens is that the osteoblast will then begin to build up bony prominences around that blood vessel, like you see at the top right. Now over time, those prominences will merge to form a complete new layer of lamellar bone around that blood vessel. So the blood vessel is now surrounded, it is a haversian canal, and it now makes up a new osteon. Now, in order to grow big, healthy, strong bones, we, of course, need to have adequate amounts of nutrition. And that includes things like getting adequate amounts of calcium in the diet, which you can get through, of course, eating dairy, but also eating green leafy vegetables, things like kale. You also need lots of vitamins. You need vitamin D for calcium absorption, vitamin C to help make collagen, and vitamin K and B12 for protein synthesis. And of course, in order to make that protein, you're going to need adequate amounts of amino acids. So you need some protein in your diet. On the other hand, we found out that too much protein in the diet can be a bad thing. So you don't want to get too much protein because that can actually lead to calcium loss. Now, in addition to adequate nutrition, you also need sufficient levels of certain hormones. Now, during childhood, there's a hormone called IGF, or insulin-like growth factor, which promotes cell division in the epiphyses. Uh, but the most important hormone is probably something called HGH, or human growth hormone. Human growth hormone is the hormone that's responsible for telling our bones to continue to grow. And so the more HGH you have, potentially the taller you're going to grow. And so if we have people that we know are going to have a genetic predisposition to being shorter than the average person, we can actually give them HGH therapy during their adolescence and childhood in order to add a couple more inches onto their height. Other hormones that are important include things like the sex steroids, estrogen, progesterone for females, and also testosterone for males.
These help to remodel the skeleton and give us a more masculine or feminine appearance. Uh, even your skeleton looks male or female, and they also help to set the timing of ossification. A third factor that's very important in maintaining the bone matrix is mechanical stress or exercise. So according to Wolf's Law, bone will grow and remodel itself in response to mechanical stressors. And by mechanical stressors here I mean load-bearing exercise. So think about the femur pictured here, the right hand side of the screen, and it articulates with the pelvis or the hip bones in a certain way. And think about how the stress is placed on that femur. Well, the more stress we place on the femur through exercise, through running, and things like that, the more the inside of that femur is going to be remodeled with increased amounts of both spongy bone and compact bone. And in particular, the trabeculae of the spongy bone tend to form struts along the areas of greatest compression. So the compression happens in sort of the top to bottom vertical part of the bone. And in older people, these are areas where the bone can become brittle and actually fracture. But in younger people, we actually make the bone as strong as we can in these areas as a result of physical stress. So the big picture here is that in order to have healthy bones, we need adequate amounts of nutrition, adequate amounts of hormones, and most importantly, frequent load-bearing exercise. So examples of load-bearing exercise include things like running, jogging, uh, hiking, and of course weightlifting. All of these basically induce microscopic tears or cracks within the collagen fibers of the bones and also induce a minute electrical current within the bones which cause greater amounts of osteoblast activity. That is, in response to prolonged or continuous stressors, the bones will thicken and become harder and become stronger as a result of that stress. For example, think about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime was a very muscular dude, and he was about 5'8", which is about my height. Now, maybe you don't know what I look like, but I am definitely not Arnold Schwarzenegger. But imagine you could take all the bones and muscles and whatever off of her skeletons and take a look at them. Do you think there would be a difference? Well, the answer here is yes. Arnold Schwarzenegger did a lot more load-bearing exercise in his lifetime than I ever have, and so I would expect his bones to be thicker and stronger than my bones. And this is important because having load-bearing exercise early on in your life is a way to store up additional calcium in your bones and stave off osteoporosis. Okay, just a note about bone remodeling. Now, although we already said that your bones stop growing in length by the time you're 25, we do say that they can continue to grow in width through appositional growth throughout most of your lifetime. The other thing that's happening during your lifetime is bone remodeling. Um, basically, even without load-bearing exercise, your bones are being dissolved and redeposited uh, throughout your life. And some authors estimate that your bones will be dissolved and redeposited some five to six times during your lifetime. It's important to realize that we're going to put more calcium in the bones and more collagen in there if they have a greater amount of nutrition and a greater amount of stress, that is uh, mechanical stress, through load-bearing exercise early on in life. Hormones, of course, are important. Uh, hormones like PTH, parathyroid hormone, calcitriol, which helps to regulate the excretion of calcium in the urine, and also calcitonin. We'll talk more about these when we get to the endocrine system. And finally, what discussion of bones would be complete without talking about broken bones, that is, fractures. And so we're going to wrap up this lecture by talking about the different types of fractures we might experience, and also talking about the way in which the body repairs fractures. So first of all, we're going to look at three different groups of terms that are used to classify fractures. The first couplet is complete versus incomplete. A complete fracture is a fracture that goes all the way through the bone, whereas an incomplete fracture is a fracture that only goes part way through the bone. So the right hand side of the screen, you can see incomplete fractures of both the radius and ulna, or the bones that make up the lower arm. You can see that the crack goes about two thirds of the way through the bone, but doesn't go all the way through, and so we call it an incomplete fracture. Another name for this type of fracture would be a green stick fracture and it tends to be common in very young people that have sort of spongy resilient bones whereas in older people we tend to get more complete fractures. The second group of terms here is displaced versus non-displaced. A displaced fracture is one in which we've had a complete fracture of the bone and the two pieces of the bone have been pulled out of the normal orientation as you see at the bottom left. On the other hand, a non-displaced fracture is where we've had a fracture but the two ends of the bone still maintain their normal position relative to one another.
Now it's important to realize that if we have a displaced fracture, we're going to need to restore the normal orientation before that fracture starts to heal. And this process of restoring the normal orientation of those two bony parts is called reduction. And finally, the last group of terms deals with compound versus simple fractures. A simple fracture is a fracture in which we may have a complete or incomplete fracture of a bone, but in which it has not pierced the skin. On the other hand, a compound fracture is where we've had a complete fracture of a bone, and one of those bony parts has actually poked its way out through the overlying muscle and skin so that it's poking out of your skin. Now, obviously, a compound fracture is much more serious than a simple or closed fracture. And that's because it is potentially introduced bacteria and other debris into the wound, which can obviously cause infection, but it can also reduce the likelihood of those two bones healing together. And so if we have a compound fracture, not only do we need to reduce that fracture, but we probably need to surgically fix those two ends of the bone together and also give that person antibiotics to ward off any type of infection. So we can also classify fractures based on the orientation of the break to the bone. For example, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see something called a transverse fracture. A transverse fracture is just a fracture that is perpendicular to the axis of the long bone. On the other hand, an oblique fracture is one that is more diagonal, whereas a spiral fracture is one, as the name implies, that spirals throughout the shaft of the bone. And spiral fractures in particular tend to result from both a compressive force and also from a twisting force. So my father-in-law got one of these a couple years ago when he was skiing. Uh, he basically went over one of the black diamonds and landed wrong, and the ski didn't pop off like it should have been. So it twisted his leg at the same time that he was landing, and that compression and twisting at the same time led to a spiral fracture. And finally, the last fracture on the right-hand side is something called a comminuted fracture. And comminuted fractures are uh, fractures that involve the production of several different bony pieces. And so they tend to be uh, one of the most serious of the closed or simple fractures because we have a lot of pieces that we need to unite together in order to get this bone to heal properly. And in most cases, comminuted fractures are going to need something more serious than just a cast. Chances are we're going to have to go in there and fix or stabilize those bone pieces together using pins and rods. So now that we've talked about the different types of fracture, we're going to talk about the ways in which the body repairs fractures, that is fracture repair. So let's imagine that you've been walking down the street, you didn't pay attention where you're going, and you slipped on a banana peel, and bam, you slipped and broke your tibia. Your tibia is your shin bone, or the long bone that makes up the majority of your lower leg. And so the first thing that's going to happen with this fracture is that we're going to have a fracture hematoma. Remember that bone, whether it's spongy bone or compact bone, has a lot of blood vessels going through it. And so when that bone is fractured or broken, the blood vessels will be broken. And that's going to lead to a lot of blood pooling underneath the skin. This is going to lead to pain and swelling and also redness. Now as a result of this interrupted blood supply, some of the tissue within the bone is going to begin to die. Now because of the inflammation that's going on, we're going to have invasion of our phagocytes. Remember the phagocytes are the white blood cells whose job it is to go into a wound and scavenge up any dead or dying tissue and also take care of any bacteria or viruses that might be present. Within a few days of the initial injury, we're going to begin to form something called a fibrocartilage callus. So initially, we're going to have a lot of phagocytotic cells in there. We're also going to have a lot of fibroblasts. They're going to lay down an initial layer of granulation tissue. And remember, granulation tissue was just a type of connective tissue that we use to repair wounds. Now, eventually, this granulation tissue is going to be invaded by osteoblasts and also chondroblasts and also fibroblasts. And the chondroblasts and the fibroblasts together are going to help to start depositing fibrocartilage in this newly broken bone. So what this fibrocartilage is going to do is form a temporary splint or union between these two broken areas of the bone. Now as this fibrocartilage callus matures, we're actually going to have movement of osteoblasts into the callus and start to ossify some of that callus into spongy bone. Now once the spongy bone moves in, we've said that we've begun to convert that fibrocartilage callus into what's called a bony callus. A bony callus is a much more permanent, stronger structure, and it takes a lot longer to develop. So whereas the fibrocartilage callus took only about a week to develop, the bony callus takes about two months to fully unite the two broken ends of the long bones. And so obviously formation of this bony callus involves our osteoblasts, which are laying down new bone. 
The chondroblasts are still very important here, as well as our osteocytes, which are the cells that are going to be left behind to maintain the existing matrix. Okay, the last stage of fracture repair is something called bone remodeling. And bone remodeling actually starts within the second or third week after the break, but it continues on for several months, even past the formation of the bony callus. So bone remodeling involves both our osteoblasts and our osteoclasts. The osteoblasts are obviously there to redeposit bone in areas where uh, the bone was destroyed due to the break, but our osteoclasts are there to remodel that bony callus and bring it back to the normal orientation of the bone. So that initially, if you break a bone, you might feel a bump along that area of the break where the bony callus was located, but over time, that bump should be planed down due to the activity of our osteoclast. And after several months, you should notice that, that bone has its normal orientation and that you can feel very little of that bony callus, and that's because it's been reworked through the process of bone remodeling. Now it's important to point out that the process of fracture repair is a natural or innate process in the body. It happens any time we break a bone. However, depending on the nature of that fracture, we may need to have some kind of surgical or medical intervention before we allow the process of bone remodeling and repair to occur. And the first of these is the process of reduction. Remember that we said we can have fractures that are non-displaced, where the two bones maintain their normal orientation, or we can have a displaced fracture. Now the displaced fracture is the one you see at the top left-hand side. We have the proximal part of the femur and the distal part, and they've been pulled away from each other. So this will start to heal even if we don't have reduction, but ideally we want to put these two pieces back into the normal orientation before healing occurs. And this is called setting of the bone, or the technical name is reduction of the bone. That is reducing the bone back to its normal orientation. Another thing that we usually have to do is immobilization. Now even though bones heal relatively quickly, we want to reduce them and immobilize their ends so that we don't have continued stress on the bone which may interfere with healing. In order to immobilize a broken bone, we often will use a splint or a cast. So here you can see somebody that has a uh, cast on for bones that are probably in the distal part of the forearm or maybe even in the carpus. And this just prevents movement of the joints and inadvertently moving the bones away from each other and it speeds the healing time. Now another type of therapy we might need is something called surgical fixation. Surgical fixation involves the placement of screws and rods, and we do this in areas where we have a very badly broken bone, usually a comminuted fracture that needs to be held together by using these rods and pins. And so here you can see an example of what we call internal fixation. This is where we go in and surgically place rods, pins, and other devices in order to hold the broken ends of the bones together so that they'll have time to heal. Now if a fracture is really bad, we might actually have to do something called external fixation. External fixation is like internal fixation in that we have pins and rods holding the bones together, but that these pins and rods in fact extend through the muscles and through the skin and are anchored to something called an external fixator. So here you can see an example of a circular fixator that is used to stabilize fractures of the tibia. On the other hand, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see an external fixator being used to stabilize a fracture of the carpus, that is the wrist, and also of the metacarpus or palm. And there's a link at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to read about this particularly gruesome injury this guy sustained. Uh, basically he was in a car wreck, car maybe flipped over, uh, his hand was outside the window, resulted in a partial degloving injury, so he lost some of the skin on his hand, and also multiple fractures within the wrist and also within the palm of the hand and this needed a very aggressive type of surgical fixation uh, involving both internal and external fixation. So in ending this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the things necessary to maintain healthy bones and also diseases that affect the bone. Now, as I said previously, exercise is very important in maintaining bone tissue. Remember that bones need adequate amounts of calcium, we need adequate amounts of protein, we need our vitamins, but we also need load-bearing exercise. So the more mechanical stress or load-bearing exercise you have for the bones, the thicker they will become. By the same token, if we remove load-bearing exercise from somebody abruptly, it can lead to a very rapid atrophy of the bones. And we tend to see this most in people that are bedridden or don't get a whole lot of exercise. The rate of demineralization of their bone can be quite rapid. And so these people can have a 20 or 30 percent bone loss within a matter of weeks or months uh, just as a result of not having enough mechanical stress on the bones.
and this is a particular worry for the astronauts that may eventually be going to Mars because they're going to be in sort of a weightless condition for six months to get there and as you're probably aware it's very hard to do load bearing exercise in space uh, even some of the astronauts that are on treadmills every day and riding on bicycles still have a substantial amount of bone loss so as you probably know, our bones become more brittle and more prone to injury as we age. And this is because of two different factors that affect the bone matrix. The first of these is something called demineralization. Demineralization is a process where calcium phosphate is leached out of the bones, sometimes as a result of our osteoclasts, and can lead eventually to osteoporosis. Now, it tends to be most rapid in women uh, in their 40s to 50s because this is the age around which they're going to go through menopause. And menopause results in an abrupt reduction in the estrogen and progesterone levels in the bloodstream. And as it turns out, both estrogen and testosterone have a protective function for the bones. That is, they tend to reduce the activity of osteoclasts. But in postmenopausal women, we have this abrupt decline in estrogen, which results because of menopause. Now, without an adequate amounts of estrogen, the osteoclasts become more active, they proliferate, and as a result, bone demineralization increases. Now, the second factor that can make our bones more fragile as we age is that we have a reduced rate of protein deposition. Remember that the matrix of bone is not only made up of the hydroxyapatite, but it's also made up of lots of strong collagen fibers, which are always breaking to relieve stress. And we need to repair and regrow these fibers uh, throughout our lifetime. But as we get older, our ability to grow and deposit new collagen fibers goes down, in part because we're not very good at absorbing amino acids through our diet, but we're also not very good at converting these amino acids into proteins within our bones. As a result, our bones become more brittle as we age, even though they might have the right amount of calcium. Okay, in the last slide of this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about osteoporosis. Now, osteoporosis is a bone disease that you're probably familiar with. You probably have somebody in your family that has osteoporosis. And basically, what osteoporosis is, is a decreased bone mass resulting in porous bones. And this can happen for several reasons. One of the things that happens is that we don't deposit as much calcium the older we get. We tend not to do as much load-bearing exercise, which also reduces calcium deposition. But most importantly, in women, the reduction in estrogen that happens after menopause really increases the rate of osteoclast activity, resulting in bone dissolution or demineralization. And so women tend to be most at risk, specifically white women and women that are postmenopausal and smokers. So this tends to increase the rate of bone demineralization. Now, some athletes can actually be at risk for osteoporosis. These are younger people, let's say in their 20s and 30s. We're talking specifically here about your very low body fat female athlete. Now, in some female athletes, they have such a low body fat that their body basically turns off the production of estrogen and stops menstruating. As a result of that decrease in estrogen, we tend to see the same types of lesions in the bones that we see in, let's say, 50 or 60 or 70 year old females. That is, we see an increased rate of bone demineralization as a result of a reduction in estrogen. One group that we don't tend to see a whole lot of osteoporosis in is, can you guess, obese people. Obese people have probably the lowest rate of osteoporosis, and this is because they're carrying around more weight throughout their lifetime, and as a result, are doing a lot more load-bearing exercise. Now, I'm not saying they're going to the gym or anything like that, but just walking around with excess body fat can actually help to induce stress on the bones, which causes increased amounts of appositional bone growth. So how do we treat osteoporosis? Well, as your mother always said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There's really very little we can do once somebody has diagnosed osteoporosis, because chances are they're in their 50s and 60s, and even if we supplement more calcium and induce more load-bearing exercise, uh, we're not going to get the rate of calcium deposition that we like. So the key here is to prevent osteoporosis by getting enough calcium in your formative years and also making sure you do a fair amount of load-bearing exercise, running, jogging, biking, things like that. And finally, avoding smoking and particularly if you're female, avoid excess alcohol.